Good evening and thank you for joining us for another of our inaugural lecture series. I am Professor Devendra Kodwani, Executive Dean of the Faculty of Business and Law here at the Open University. I am proud and privileged to be hosting one of our inaugural lectures, which showcases our research, teaching, and knowledge exchange portfolios. Each year, Vice Chancellor the Vice Chancellor invites newly appointed and promoted professors to give an inaugural lecture. Over the course of a year, our inaugural lecture series provides an opportunity for, to celebrate academic excellence with each lecturer representing a significant milestone in an academic, academic's career. This, e this evening, we will hear from Leslie Butt, Professor of Regional Economy in the Department of Public Leadership and Social Enterprise, Pulse, at the Open University Business School, who will explore the recent increase in public interest in space exploration and the future of using urban and regional economics for assessing its impact. But before we begin, some housekeeping. The lecture will be followed by a question and answer session then we invite you to celebrate with us downstairs for those of those who are with us in person. For anyone in the audience using Twitter, please feel free to tweet using the hashtag displayed at the Open University. Uh, and let the world join us this evening. For members of our audience joining us via YouTube, Please use the email address provided and keep your comments and questions brief so that we can address them during the Q&A. And now, some background about Professor Leslie Budd. Professor Leslie Budd is a professor of regional economy in the Department of Public Leadership and Social Enterprise at the Open University Business School. He is an economist who is internationally known for his work on regional and urban economics in, in the context of global issues. The digital economy, the socioeconomic impact of Brexit, and evaluating the social, socioeconomic benefits of space exploration. He is currently director of the Space Exploration and Analysis Research, SPARE, cluster in the Faculty of Business and Law and a visiting professor at the Center for Brexit Studies at Birmingham City University. Leslie has undertaken economic and financial analysis for a number of regional, national, and international organizations. These include Corporation of London, the Small Business Service, the Capital Market Authority in Riyadh, and Iraq Ministry of Planning. Between 2014 and 2016, he was Special Economic Advisor to the Committee for Enterprise, Trade, and Investment Committee of the Northern Ireland Assembly, producing research and policy briefings, for example, the consequences of the devolved taxation and the impact of Brexit on the Northern Ireland economy. It now gives me great pleasure to introduce Professor Leslie But Leslie, please come. Thank you for those kind words. Okay. This lecture focuses on the socio-economic analysis and evaluation of the space economy, its industry, and international exploration programs. It covers research that attempts to create a critical narrative of the social ch societal challenges that go beyond a narrow purview of space exploration as not just as an outcome of science. Now, we all know that mathematics and space, uh, sorry, mathematics and science drive all knowledge, but the growth of the socioeconomic benefits generated by the space economy, its exploration and industry between the Earth and space economy is also becoming very important. 
And I've never subscribed to C.P. Uh, Snow's notion of two cultures between natural sciences and humanities. He's a much better fiction writer uh, than he is about describing those, uh, th that false opposition. <clears throat> now, this is a learning journey which is central to the student experience of the Open University. So mine is no different in many respects. Like any journey, there's been continuities and discontinuities along the way. The picture on the right is by the Urbanites, a 1980s radical art collection that decorated the ceiling of the Scala Cinema in, in London, which some of you here I know, know well, influenced by the Sistine Chapel in Rome. And my own identity reflects my professional and personal commitment to things urban and regional. In the last, oh, sorry, this slide is, so I'm trying to do two things at once. In the last 30 years, I've developed uh, an interest and expertise in regional economics and transport, but also retained an interest uh, in structural engineering and architecture. Also reflects my own, if you like, professional and personal journey from my father working at British Airways for 30 years as an engineer through to structural engineers, economics, transport planning, regional economics, um, higher education, <clears throat> and also my professional and personal commitment to all things urban and regional. Four years ago, along with my colleagues in the Science, Technology, Engineering and Maths faculty, Manish Patel and Vic Pearson, we were successful with our benefits of the European Exploration Roadmap in Economics, known as Beers Project, funded by the European Space Agency. This outcome was a starting point of my interest and in developing expertise in the socioeconomic impacts of space. There are lots of people to thank on the, along the way on that journey. Some of here are here tonight and online. Let's, uh... This is an overview of the global space economy in 2021. As can be seen from that representation, there are three largest contributors. Consumer services related to media and communications, navigation, positioning and timing of satellites, and government space uh, budgets. <clears throat> the projected growth of 1.5, sorry, I keep doing this, um, the projected uh, growth of 1.5 trillion to 2040 shows the widening and deepening impact of space in many industries and regions across the world. The distribution of the global space economy is shown in this slide that reflects the changing trajectory of advanced economies but also the growth of space manufacturing underpinned by the fourth industrial revolution and industry 4.0, known as I 5.0 strategies. They are becoming an important component of the earth and space economy and its urban and regional territorial distribution. I 5.0 is closely associated with the fourth industrial revolution whose design principles have direct applications to space science, technology, and innovation spillovers. And you can see those design principles, which also co correlate to regionally based industrial policy as an agency of development across the global economy, stimulating space 4.0. So 
For example, places like Bremen, Glasgow, Shetland, Toulouse and Turin were locales for shipbuilding, aeronautics and um, oil and gas production. But this continuity has depended on active industrial strategies and policies ever since. The Orion European Service Module case study, which we'll come on to, also demonstrates the role of space as a propulsive industry in enabling a range of municipalities and regions to exploit I 4.0 technologies and innovation spillovers in different urban and regional contexts. So this is a statement that was made by the Ministerial Council of ESA in December 2016. I will re read it out, but because it shows the multidisciplinary nature increasingly of space exploration and its importance in addressing societal challenges. The space, that space serves societal needs, responds to European and global challenges and offers opportunities notably to those related to the attainment of sustainable development goals and socio-economic growth, mitigation of geopolitical risks, which have been enhanced much more recently, security, science, knowledge, climate change, and a digital Europe. And I'm not someone who usually states publicly I'm proud of things, but I'm proud of working at the Open University, because it's one of the few universities in the world where you can bring these things together. And as um, people in this room have done a lot to actually uh, fulfill that role. So there's high level of cooperation between the EU and, and ESA. The EU relies heavily on ESA's technical excellence and a large part of the EU space budget is delegated to ESA to the extent that the ESA, EU today is amongst the largest contributors to ESA programs. Article 189 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union that builds upon the Lisbon Treaty of 2009 calls for the EU to establish appropriate relations with ESA, um, which is a complex phenomenon in itself, but at least it's a public statement of collaboration. So looking at new economic aspects between the space and earth economy, here we see this, uh, the territory I mentioned to spaceports, um, which, as we can see from their dimensions, are actually very urban and very regional and connect two kinds of territory, earth and, and space. The figure on the right is taken from the 2021 National Space Strategy, showing the territorial distribution of the key nodes of the UK space industry. Spaceports are launch sites for satellites. They are either horizontal or vertical. The former using conventional aircraft with satellites slung under their wings, which are then launched beyond land. The latter consists of rockets launched over water carrying satellites. Presswick is an example of a horizontal spaceport, and Shetland is a vertical one. They have benefits and costs, including economic growth, employment, low operational costs, but environmental damage. So it's not all unalloyed joy from this kind of technology and its development. Spaceports are increasingly important in regional development around the world, especially in Europe, as well as promoting space 4.0 industrial strategies. So in developing our socio-economic analysis of the Pennant Assessment of Spaceport Scotland, known as CBAS, and associated space exploration research SPEAR cluster activities contributes to the development of using urban and regional economics as a framework for space exploration and the role of spaceports in space-based industrial strategies. Don't blame me for the acronyms. Um, they're the fault of my much more creative space science colleagues who are in the room, but I won't point to them. 
So this gives us an overview of the trajectory of the global exploration um, roadmap version three of the European Space Agency. It was adopted, as I said, in December 2014. It proposed to consolidate exploration activities in a single European exploration envelope program, E3P, which integrates the three ESA exploration destinations, beyond Earth, the Moon, and Mars, as part of a single exploration process. It also consists of four cornerstones. Humans in low Earth orbit, the International Space Station and Columbus 2030 are examples. Humans beyond low Earth orbit, Heracles and in situ resource utilization, otherwise known as space mining. Human lunar robotic exploration, the, the Moon Gateway and Orion ESM programs, and Mars robotic exploration, ExoMars, and Mars sample return. These cornerstones were analysed and evaluated by the Open University Beers research team to identify the range of socioeconomic benefits and their direct, indirect, upstream and downstream impacts. So, direct impacts and upstream benefits as shown in this slide. And they connect the Earth and space economy, but there's a tendency to measure these types of benefits using quantitative methods to create indicators of outcomes, which policymakers and politicians love. But I always say, if you want a number, I'll give you one. But things are much more complex than that, as we know. Um, and the invasion bad mathematics into economics is something that bugbear of mine for many years. Um, and economists trying to reduce econ you know, the, the, the methods of physics to that of economics to make it a science would seem laughable to many of the scientists in this audience, as well as me, but I don't claim to be a scientist. Similarly, there are a set of direct, indirect and direct benefits, which connect the Earth and space economy. In this case, this tends to measure using qualitative-based methods to create more descriptive indicators. But this does represent a bigger challenge for analysis and evaluation of these types. And certainly for the Beers, Seabass and Spear teams and activities, we are undertaking that. But it is a, it is a challenge. And I have to say, you know, the title is From Urbanite to Astronaut, and I count myself as an apprentice, but I'm very grateful to my space science colleague because I've learned a lot, and I've read space science papers, which I really don't understand, but they are intrinsically interesting. Well, it's because I don't have the training. Now, we, we come on to the impact evaluation framework that on the benefits of the ESA exploration roadmap in socioeconomics, beers. And I won't explain why it's called beers, but again, um, my creative colleague wanted the ESA Ministerial Council to talk about the benefits of beers in space exploration, which shows insight and humor, which we do have a, in abundance at the OU. So this was an ESA-funded research project to evaluate E3P by the Beers research team, drawn from three OU faculties. We created this evaluation impact framework based on a, on a stage based uh, stage approach using a multi-criteria methodological framework. This was first pioneered over 10 years ago with other OU colleagues in the Electronic Governments for You project funded by the European Union. So the first is a critique of conventional studies, which are usually cost-benefit analysis. But when it comes to qualitative base benefits, the, the response is usually, and it's too complex. And we are talking about some of the large management consultancies that um, 
can add to their list of failures. But I'll uh, not be controversial there. Secondly, input-output analysis is an economic method most closely associated with the Soviet American economist Leontiev, frequently used in regional economics, and it provides a comprehensive treatment of the economy as a whole, accompanying all of its industrial sectors using standardized input-output analysis. And I'm very pleased to see uh, some of our ex-PhD students here tonight who've got great expert T's on input output and I and as I ever have and also a colleague from the Department of Economics. And again, that kind of environment in which we attract people like that from all over the world is again one of the benefits of the OU. And I'm not looking for promotion. That's me. <laughs> but it but you know it is is a fact. Now the capital's approach is based on Pierre Bourdieu's approach. He's the, he was the French anthropologist and sociologist. And he criticised conventional economic capital as being too focused on material exchange. He argued that people from different social positions, different from one another, with regard to their possession of three forms of capital, economic, social and cultural. There's also a relation here to the continuities and discontinuities of my own journey. In the, I had a research secondment to the Centre for Urban Sociology in Paris in 1985. And many of my French colleagues had actually studied for their PhDs under Bourdieu. And every Friday I went to his public lectures at the Collège de France. Um, and that also formed the basis of my developing interest and links to the OU by becoming a part-time PhD student two years later. So there's lots of people in this room to blame, but I won't go there. And finally, we have, but these forms of capital can also be classified as community capitals or resources that have increasingly been used in studies evaluating public policy programs within a community or society. So I think it was about two years ago, Greater Manchester Authority took on more public service roles and they undertook a capitals um, a, approach to evaluate what the benefits might be of that policy shift and what kind of public management and services that they may deliver. So in a sense, we are ahead of the game and this kind of approach is becoming increasingly important based a lot on urban and regional economics. Fourthly, logic models are widely used in program evaluation. These models represent the most important relationships between project activities and expected outcomes, outputs and impacts. And finally, data visualization methods were adapted to graphically demonstrate some of the outcomes. And we, and in the Space 19 Plus strategy for funding ESA's programs for the next five years, uh, the OU beers team's work was mentioned, but they were particularly happy, as policymakers and politicians are, with the graphic representation of some of our results. <coughs> Excuse me. So this is the adaptation of Bourdieu's capitals otherwise known as community resources. So for the beers program, we expanded beyond the three uh, programs, and you can see the definitions there. And you could probably evaluate any kind of program, kind of the interaction of these things, because they do show the, ki the kind of socioeconomic integration um, of social sciences with natural sciences and also humanities. <clears throat> so, but you, you might wonder why we didn't choose education as a capital for the Beers project. And we've had a lot of debates about that and we can't actually remember. But it seemed to me that we didn't include it as a discrete um, capital because it related to elements in human capital, particularly skills formation and training, as well as conforming to the OU's purpose of promoting lifelong learning. 
But the choice of capitals is pragmatic, like many evaluation projects, and it depends on the nature of the project and its context. I like pictures. And I like old technology. I'm of a generation that actually remembers, we had a day off school when the first Russian satellite was launched long ago about the reputation of Russia. But the International Space Station is a 20-year cooperation between the European, US, Japanese, and Russian space agencies. Um, and there, their logos, logos are uh, fairly obvious. Um, and I, I, have, I haven't deliberately put um, the Russian one on the bottom right. Um, but ISS orbits the Earth every 90 minutes. <clears throat> a board of astronauts from various participating nations we want to take experiments that have led to a number of benefits, including technological, environmental, and health ones. Many of these experiments are under micro-gravity uh, conditions, which is weightlessness. Leading to new scientific evidence, technologies, and innovation. The ISS closely connects the Earth and space economy through environmental mapping, including weather forecasting and managing the effects of extreme climate changes, for example, tsunami. The current challenge is the continuous participation of Roskomos due to the war in Ukraine, for which the head of the Russian Space Agency announced Russia's intention to withdraw next year, despite senior NASA figures seeking to continue to the collaboration. Um, and it is quite interesting, and, and the dynamics of this, and I don't want to go into it, but many, a number of the Russian um, cosmonauts above the, uh, aboard the ISS were actually wearing uh, Ukrainian T-shirts and flags. And the colleagues at ESA we dealt with, ESTEC, always said, the thing about Russians is if you sup and drink with them, they're really good collaborators. And the ISS is important for its technology. I mean, the old the Soyuz rockets which launched it are now using SpaceX is really old kit. And Eztech in the Netherlands, which is the technical and scientific branch of ESA, they've got mock-ups, which I'll show you later. And you go in, you think, blimey, this, rem you know, this reminds me, frankly, of my childhood, flying on Dakota D DC-3s at 5,000 feet without, you know, no flat beds, no business class in those days. An old kit, um, which I am probably... Uh, but it is remarkable. And it's remarkable, I think, that's come into the uh, public perception of the benefits of space, particularly of ISS in the last few years, using old technology, but with new kind of adaptations and new discoveries. So, ISS inputs and outputs. So we have input-output analysis to analyze the economic effects, but there are, so the input is the onboard experiments, and that on the left-hand side is the, is the mock-up, uh, where they undertake experiments. And when I first got involved with the beers program, they kept talking about ice cubes, and I thought, hmm, they just drink gin and tonic up there, is it ice cubes? It's actually little mobile Laboratories, and they're called ice cubes because they're cold. But it's like, oh, huh. oh well, perhaps we'll, have, well, perhaps we'll have an ISS gin. I mean, we've got Edinburgh gin these days. So, um, The image on the right-hand side is of the XML uh, MRI scanner that can diagnose osteoporosis in minutes as a result of the ISS astronauts undertaking experiments on themselves, and building a prototype that's now being commercialized for international markets. Osteoporosis is a condition that ISS astronauts can suffer for at least four years after re-entering the Earth. Telemedicine is also a health benefit because of the development of robotic arms for surgery. And this has led to experimental collaboration between NASA and U.S. Um, US health companies aboard the ISS in real time. So aboard the IRS, ISS, they've been using these, medical, these robotic arms. And in real time, this is uh, 
projected down to um, hospital theatres where surgeons are actually undertaking um, uh, operations. So, again, these connections, you know, the, the ISS is a classic example of connection between the Earth and space economy. Now, this is a particular experiment called electromagnetic levitation, EML, uh, aboard the ISS. <clears throat> Along the top, we've got the E3P activities, outputs, application, and technological externalities. And so it's cool cop, which could be a kind of, you know, dodgy US film, magnifas, and semitherm. Um, and this is using the Columbus Laboratory on ISS. So this EML allows metal to be melted at high temperatures and then cooled under micro gra gravity conditions, weightlessness, to create new alloys for development on the Earth economy. And that would not be possible on the Earth because its weightlessness allows various met metals to be uh, combined to create an alloy. So to actually do them on Earth, you would actually have to build a chamber under microgravity conditions. But again, it shows these kind of insights and things that you can do the, on a board space under weightlessness and not on the Earth. So the figure, so if we look at the outputs, copper and cobalt, nickel, titanium, silicon. Along the bottom, you've got the ex experiment, com experimental component, ready to market applications, commercialization, future applications, and then value added. So those important linkages. And without things like E3P programs, um, like the ISS, these things would not be possible. But the inputs and outputs of this form of technological capital also creates environmental capital as a consequence, as well as innovation spillovers. <clears throat> but all three experiments can be said to relate to urban and regional economic development, smart cities, of which Milton Keynes is apparently one, and uh, at lunch today, some of my friends and colleagues were actually impressed, I think because the sun was out. But um, it is, because, uh, again, it's um, a smart city and lots of things are going on here. So architecture, engineering, building materials, and intra and inter-regional transport systems that generate locational advantage and agglomeration economies. So, the Orion ESM network as a driver of space locales. So, the European service module is the service module component of the NASA Orion spacecraft, serving as primary power and propulsion component until it's discarded at the end of each mission to the moon. So, funded by NASA and ESA, Orion ESM is a six-phase program to service the Artemis lunar missions from 2018 with annual launches between 2021 and 27, with both robotic and human missions. During the development, sorry, it's gone too far. Whoops. So during the development and construction of ESM, Airbus has drawn under its experience as a prime contractor for ESA's automo automated transfer vehicle between um, spacecraft and, say, the moon. <coughs> ESA selected Airbus in Germany to lead a consortia of companies to develop and construct phases one to three of ESM, all of whom had... ATV experience. The network of contractors and subcontractors includes more than 18 countries in 10 different European, so 18 companies in 10 different European countries, as shown on the map, unfortunately excluding the UK. 
The experience of the members of the consortia working together over the first three missions represent a form of organizational capital with an externality consequence of social and human capital. As the network work gains in efficiency, <clears throat> lower transaction costs, which is the cost of doing business, result. The, Ethernet, uh, the ESM network is also a driver of space as a propulsive industry within the agglomeration economies in the space city regions and municipalities <coughs> where the network members are located. But also, the one thing we overlook is the role of space, space science and exploration in contributing to the uh, design economy. So, the Orion capsule is a successor to the famous Apollo ones and central to plans for lunar missions uh, of the Artemis one program which has six phases and Mars exploration programs in the future. Much of its design principles are drawn from lunar upon for lunar architecture projects, particularly the use of new materials, as well as in situ resource utilization, again known as lunar mining. But there's a lot of noise about the knowledge economy. Um, my parents-in-law were in care homes where I was really impressed by that branch of the knowledge economy, where the carers were highly skilled in just things like putting on their clothes. When I tried to put my father-in-law's jacket on, he nearly broke his arm. It's a knowledge economy. You know, there's, there's nonsense talked about it, and again, it infuriates me. <clears throat> but in fact, it's really about the design economy, of which the relationship between Orion ESM, lunar habitats, an ISRU can said to constitute one. In its 2018 report, the UK Design Council stated, design and design skills are the heart of the fourth industrial revolution. They give us the tools to respond to these unprecedented challenges and instigate the growth, innovation and jobs that will drive the UK's global future. And we define this activity is the design economy. The value created by those <clears throat> who use design in a wide range, a wide variety of industries. This includes designers in design industries, other roles in design industries, as well as designers in other sectors of the economy, such as banks, consultancies, automotive or aerospace. <clears throat> now we come on to if you like, definitions of organisational capital and its linkages. I'm grateful to my colleague, Stefania Palladini um, of, the, of Birmingham City University for bringing this to my attention. So intellectual resources and development linking to organisational capital, human capital and relational factors. This form of capital is rooted in corporate strategy and accounting valuations. But the later elements include human capital, relational factors, intellectual resources and development, as well as organisational culture and structure, learning and intellectual property. And again, going back to the continuities and discontinuities of the journey at the Open University, one of the original authors was J.C. Spender, a former visiting professor at the Open University Business School. Now, the ESM can also be considered a learning organisation in that the process of manufacturing a series of large items creates learning effects for the internal and external stakeholders through collaborative working and sharing knowledge. This form of capital also links to Space 4.0 industrial strategies in countries and places participating in the ESM consortium. Again, this shows the locational distribution of Orion ESM's organisational capital. It represents the proportion by funding based on a hub and spoke model with Airbus Germany and Thales Alenia 
in Italy as the main hubs. But there's also a locational hierarchy within the network and trade and transport links amongst the participants. <clears throat> but most importantly is the creation of agglomeration economies in the network locations as a basis of the territorial distribution of the socioeconomic benefits of various ESM. So it's just another example of the way in which deindustrialization can actually take away a major propulsive industry, be it shipbuilding, mining, etc. And the knock-off impacts are in, in direct employment, but the indirect employment. And where I live in North London, um, if you had a major hit to, economically to North London, you think of all the coffee shops that would close, um, which may or may not be a good thing, but that's, your, that's, your, that's, that's, that's a personal choice. Let's come on to agglomeration economies. Here we have a short definitions and details of the three types of agglomeration, localization, urbanization, and activity complex economies. So these type of economies are central to urban and regional economics as well as territorial development in which organizations and individuals co-locate for a range of activities. One aspect of agglomeration is that firms are often located near to each other, leading to cost savings arising from urban agglomeration. This concept also relates to the idea of economies of scale and network effects, and important links between transport improvements and agglomeration. They can be intensified without increasing the physical concentration of firms and workers, but rather by improving transport connectivity. The propulsive industry in activity complex economies refers to the work of the famous Schumpeter, uh, Joseph Schumpeter, most closely associated with the concept of creative discussions. And these definitions are based on edited work of John Parr at UCL. So let's come on to lunar architecture. Again, new economic aspects of the lunar region. Because the moon can be seen to be its planet, but it could be described as a region. So the UK architectural practice Foster and Partners are promoting their lunar village, whilst a large US firm, Skidmore, Owens and Merrill, is creating its moon village, both as lunar habitats. The latter was on show at the Venice Biennale Ex Exhibition in 2021. So again, this is an example of architectural firms, sci space science and exploration, the design economy, and cultural capital. So SOM worked closely with ESA on a semi-inflatable habitat design, which could be part of a long-term vision for an international moon settlement, insulated by regolith a locally found material. Now, I'm not one of those space cadets who believes that we're all going to move to the moon, like in Douglas Adams' uh, famous book and radio series, but rather you will see scientists and engineers staying longer on the moon to explore and undertake research. <clears throat> there may be benefit for both the lunar habitats, but also the Earth economy. <coughs> There's also strong support for um, the development, starting with the former director of ESA, Jan Werner, and now through the formal cooperation agreement <coughs> between ESA and the large architectural firms for lunar and Mars habitat architecture. I won't go near... Mars, because that is just too, too challenging, frankly, but is also an interesting future development. And again, we have experts um, in the room can tell you more about that than I ever could in a lifetime, frankly. But the proposed location of the moon village is on the most favourable part of the moon, near the South Polar region on the rim of the Shackleton Crater. This self-sufficient settlement can use continuous daylight that that, receive, that region receives throughout the year. But again, let's go back to the design principles. Atmosphere, thermal protection, meteorites, radiation, 
moonquakes. Regolith consists of 45% oxygen as well as water. And now Tallinn University is using this material to build solar panels for other regions of the moon. An issue in other moons because you get two week days and nights. And the Chinese have landed on the dark side of the moon, but, um, which is interesting. Whether they're fans of Pink Floyd or uh, play it continuously, I don't know, but is their worst album. But again, we can discuss that. Um, helium-3 is important for cold fusion, a potentially safer nuclear power that can contribute to sustainable energy transition that also has implications for the Earth economy as we face energy um, challenges at the moment, um, as well as future developments. But it's been unsuccessful to date. But there are also important developments in the governance environmental sustainability of space missions is also occurring. And under its um, space and governance workstream, the OU's Astrobiology Research Programme is addressing these issues. So, future research. This image is taken from a report by the Space Science Board of the US National Academy of Sciences, published in 1965 and again reflects the continuities and discontinuities. Henry Ford might have said history's bunk, but history is always with us, and we often, as we know to our cost, don't learn from it. So hopefully we can learn from these earlier research for the future. So, particularly in relation to the Earth and space economy. So the, ro the role of I 4.0 in, in stimulating space 4.0 and its developing relationship to environmental, social and governance, ESG criteria, is important. This criteria is a, a set of standards for companies' operations that socially conscious investors use to screen potential investments. Environmental criteria consider how a company performs as a steward of nature. The social criteria examines how it manages relationships with employees, suppliers, customers, and the communities where it operates. Governance deals with a company's leadership, executive pay, audits, internal control, and shareholder rights. It can be argued that much of what constitutes space science, for example, the Moon and Mars rovers, is actually part of the design economy, to which space exploration in general supports its growth. In 2019, the Design Museum in London had a space exploration exhibition to further exemplify this relationship. The next steps on the journey is to further progress a multidisciplinary and cross-faculty approach. This can make significant contribution to addressing the societal challenges of future space exploration, as well as analyzing and evaluating the socioeconomic benefits between the Earth and space economy. Just to thank everyone who's come and for your patience, and keeping you from your refreshments, uh, both here and online. But I also want to thank the one person who has enabled so much of this journey. As a global commodities analyst, she has taught me so much about the mining and metals industry, particularly opening my eyes to its potential in relation to the space economy. So here's thanks to my wife, Vanessa Davidson. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. Fantastic, uh, thought-provoking 
reflections and, and findings from your research. Thank you for sharing. So it's time for us to hear from you uh, in the audience here in the theater as well as online for your questions and answers, chance to discuss with Leslie some of the aspects of uh, what he has presented and other questions you may have. So Leslie, please join me in the... Thank you. Sitting here. Yeah. So, before you ask questions, I'd suggest uh, wait for the roving mic to reach you, and please tell who you are from where you are, and keep your questions uh, or comments uh, brief so that we can have as many <coughs> questions and answers as possible. And those who are watching online and will have any questions for Leslie, please use the email, which should be somewhere here. Yeah comes to inaugural lecture at open.sc.uk and we'll try to pick up those email uh, questions as well. So thank you for your patience. Uh, we are, Leslie, are happy to take questions now? Of course. Yeah. Questions? Uh, we have one from online straight away. Helen? Yeah, I've got a couple that are related online, so I'm going to read them both because they're, they're around the same theme. <coughs> Could Russia's involvement in space programs aid their worldwide reintegration once the war in Ukraine is over, or even help contribute to potential peace by keeping conversation lines open while the war is ongoing? And another one, does it seem likely that the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the subsequent pulling out of collaborative projects will lead to a significant economic loss? Well, they've already suffered a, a, an economic loss, and obviously it depends on regime and political change. But it's v very interesting that senior figures at NASA really do benefit from that collaboration. Um, difficult position for the astronauts and heads of Roscomos. Uh, beyond that, um, I have really nothing to say because it's too complex, too early. Um, and frankly, too tragic. I'm someone who's not usually depressed, but 2022 is not turning out to be a good year. <clears throat> Just there. <clears throat> Thank you. My name's Melvin Hurley, and my question relates to funding. NASA has suffered from political interference since the start of the Mercury missions. And when I refer to Mercury, I'm talking the manned missions. Yeah. Today, it's even further hit by political intervention in their funding streams to the degree that they've moved to a system whereby they tender to private companies. How much of a threat do you see private companies being to the continued exploration and the economic effects of space? Um, that's kind of hitchhiker's guide to the, to the galaxy territory. Well, SpaceX is subsidized by NASA, and <clears throat> it's inevitable. Um, and the state enables so much, which is misunderstood by most. And the issue with funding is, <clears throat> I mean, when Trump was in power, he wanted a space army. And there's always the issue of security and space and who owns space in those treaties. Um, <clears throat> I don't think they're a threat, but I do think they could be like, you know, the new robber barons of the digital companies. But as Sh you know, Schumpeter pointed out, you know, um, but if you actually think of the, without the, the public funding, they won't do anything. I mean, <clears throat> Elon Musk would not be able to take over Twitter, uh, and they can do some good things, like in South Australia with battery technologies, etc., etc. But again, it's about regulation, it's about governance and law. But also, the, I think off the top of my head, the Space 19 strategy of ESA for its funding for the next five years was 19 billion euros. That's the equivalent of each citizen in the whole of Europe, not just the EU, going to the cinema once a week. They're big numbers, but it's like when people discuss public debt. We live in a 1.5 trillion economy per year. 
So many of these sort of figures, now they make a difference on the ground, but if you think of their kind of benefits, but it's a kind of, you know, it's, it's and again, it's the way in which um, the, U the UK space strategy goes on about global Britain. It's all about security. And it's like, well, Boris Johnson dismissed the idea of European ground wars. <clears throat> As Macmillan said, it's, you know, it's, it's about events, dear boy, events. And was a question? No? Ah, there in the front, second row. Get the mic. Thank you, Les. Thank you for a fascinating talk this evening. Um, we've just recently had a, a government white paper on so the... So you are, Phil. Oh, sorry. Phil you Thompson, University of Bath. Um, thank you for a fascinating talk. Um, we've just recently had a government white paper on levelling up and trying to address, or purporting to try and address, regional imbalances. How do you see... Or where do you envisage the space industry playing a role in levelling up Britain? Well, funnily enough, I actually put in a paper with my colleague Alessandro Sanchino about place-based leadership of space city regions and municipalities, referring to the ESM. Unfortunately, the Friends Providence uh, uh, funding let us down, but we put it in again. But if you take somewhere like Yeovil, so Yeovil, poor town near where you live, um, centre of the Western sc Westland scandal. But um, an Italian helicopter company, and the name escapes me, took it over. And there's space activities there. Again, one of my colleagues works with um, Airbus in Stevenage. In the 1980s, Stevenage was the insurance capital of Europe. Mergers, collapse in the market, you know, became a relatively poor place. But you can actually see... <coughs> these, you know, these demonstration effects. And again, if you look at the relationship to battery metals and things like green hydrogen, which is becoming important. So the treatment of um, batteries on the ISS by hydrogen expands their life. So there's a link there. So you could see these kind of um, towns with it former industrial heritage, Stoke is an example of where you come from, and where ceramics is a very good insulating material for the Orion space capsules. But my own view, even as a dyed in wool Londoner, privilege in London is, um, is bad economics and bad politics. And frankly, London needs to be leveled down. And I think the space industry can do something in its associations with aeronautics and aerospace, uh, sorry, and automotive, to level up some of those towns in a kind of distributed way. And that's what we want to explore, the degree to which place-based leadership in, in those places in the UK and Italy might achieve that. Thank you. I think we have a question next there. Hi, uh, uh, I'm Alan Cochran uh, from Social Sciences. Um, I did once have a close relationship with uh, Les as one of his PhD supervisors 153 years ago. Um, <laughs> it's all his fault. <laughs> Blame him. Um, <laughs> I just, I, that was a fascinating uh, talk. I, I, I'm interested, one of the things that came across, of course, is the, is the direct and indirect effect of, uh, of investment in space exploration. I think that's interesting. The question I have is, the indirect effects, could there have been other investments which might have had those indirect effects? Or could there have been other investments which might even have better indirect effects? Is there something particular about space exploration which gives you this range of uh, indirect effects which are particularly good for the economy in various ways? Or is that, uh, you know, if you looked at something else, I don't know, if you looked at military expenditure or um, expenditure on universities or whatever it was, would you be able to find uh, a range of indirect effects uh, which were not intended, because I mean, they're not intended, I presume, no. by, the, by the people spending the money in the first place. Are there, is it, why, do you think there's something special about space, uh, work in the space exploration industry, if you like, that generates particularly powerful and important and worthwhile uh, spin-offs? Um, well, I agree with other direct impacts, and it's the, it's the kind of societal and political choices about resources. And I do look upon myself as a kind of a apprentice astronaut. You know, I went from urbanite to astronaut, and it's your fault. Um, 
But I think what's interesting for me about space is the way in which you can bring and the socioeconomic impacts. <clears throat> you can bring together socioeconomic benefits, location, geography that interacts with, with a number of sectors, automotive, but also universities. And as I said, the OU is a classic few, you know, frankly at the time, we were astounded we got the ESA funding for beers because we were up against the big consultancies. But this is one of the few universities could do that. But I think a better understanding, and some of the things that have come out in the last 10 years with regard to environmental sustainability. And in the scale of things, um, in the scale of things compared to military expenditure, it's not that much. But, <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> so people would say, well, why can't you have clean water? But it, well, we can have clean water and we can fund it in parts of the world. But also some of the scientific experiments and discoveries and exploration are actually bringing about ways on the ground of addressing that. So that would be my argument at stage. I'm not saying it's primary, <coughs> but um, uh, I mean, just reading some of the my frustration with science papers is they're intrinsically interesting, and for me, difficult. I mean, I don't have the maths either. And my, but my response is, this is really interesting, and and there's not enough and that I mean, so that would be. But as I said, I've become a bit of a convert, so, um, you know, but I, I actually do think it's worth investigating. And I'll just give an example. Take Glasgow. Uh, Glasgow is now become, the Glasgow sub-region has become the largest manufacturer of satellites below 250 kilos. With it, you know, it's, um, and if you could say that's linked to a kind of industrial archaeology. The issue is, of course, all these commercial satellites that are thrown up and the environmental damage. So there is a kind of balance to be struck. But I, th um, but <clears throat> what I, um, one of the, I was in John Lewis and um, Brent Cross collecting a parcel one day, and it came up. This is a before the lockdown. One of the Mars landers, and everyone just stopped and watched. And I, I kind of enjoyed that moment because I thought, well, actually, there's there's a lot behind this. But we need to do more work in it. And again, my view is it should be more multidisciplinary and more cross-faculty. Yeah. We have a question here. Dave, come up. <coughs> you got to introduce yourself, Dave. Okay, it's um, David Bailey, University of Birmingham. Thank you very much. Um, sorry to raise the B word, but Brexit, uh, post-Brexit, UK is out of Galileo, as far as yeah. I can understand. <coughs> a lot of speculation about one web or whether that could be made into something but could you talk a bit about the impact of brexit and the possible cost of that are there any opportunities for global britain in terms of going or is it just these big platforms now there is i mean the problem you know <clears throat> we're in this kind of interregnum in a way um i mean a brexit opportunity would actually again um put Rhys Mogg on the ISS, but again, that's personal <laughs> prejudice. Um, the problem is that, what, again, in terms of one web and Galileo, is that this, I mean, right, let me say this publicly, and I'm willing to defend it. This is the most stupid incumbent government in my lifetime, and I've seen a few. And when I was um, special economic advisor to the SETI committee, in Northern Ireland. I wrote the first briefing on Brexit. And I gave evidence to the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee. There were 23 peers and members of parliament on that committee. Three had a clue of what Brexit actually meant, particularly for Northern Ireland. So similarly, so if you, the three, in one of the slides, which will be available, there's the three major EU programs, <coughs> which, the, uh, which the UK cannot bid for because it's a third member country. And so if you think about Surrey satellites, a number of things. Um, and the argument you could make about the possibility of Scottish independence, but the growing space sector in, in Glasgow could bail out um, some of the fiscal implications. But it's, it's, dam it's damaging. And um, the, other th the other thing is just things like the Erasmus programmes, the flow of students and 
you know, <coughs> the astrobiology program here is its first successful PhDs. That's a really important thing. But where are they going to go? So we have, you know, the COVID, we haven't been hit by the consequence of Brexit, but each stage you're going to fight. Look what's happened to automotive. Look what's happened to air. You know, if Airbus pulls out of the UK, you know, which it could do, building the wings, et cetera, et cetera, at Broughton um, and uh, in North Wales, there's difficulties. Brexit's a disaster, whatever way you look at it. But there's no strategic thought. And I, have, I, was, <coughs> I was at lunch with you today, so I didn't read the, um, the Queen's speech. But there's nothing about science. There's nothing about to technology. And, I mean, you know, I think global Britain in five years' time will look like a, a fairground merry-go-round. Not a very encouraging thought to... <laughs> <laughs> but look, I'm old enough and ugly enough for uh, uh, younger enough. colleagues. Fair enough. We live uh, through these things yeah. and we come out the other end. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay, so I think we need to uh, wind this. It's been fantastic conversation. The amount of interest we had generated, Leslie. Is there a question there? Yeah, just Let's take the one more I, question. I just have to ask a question because there's yeah. a woman who's asked a question, yeah. so we've got to go for it, haven't we? Yes. I'm just curious, Les, you uh, talked about space as a uh, Please introduce yourself. Sorry, I'm Sheila Watts, and I work for something called the FIA Foundation. Thank you. Um, you mentioned space as a propulsive industry. Yeah. And we touched a little bit <clears> on private and public, but you talked a lot about... Uh, initiatives, I think, and programs which are largely publicly funded one yeah. way or another. What is your take on the impact in terms of territorial claim and also local economic impact of Elon's projectile, which I still think is the funniest thing in the world that his uh, advisors <coughs> told him to design it to look like that, um, and everybody else's private space missions? Well, I think space, I mean, without the public fund funding, you know, it's the classic, you know, monopoly capitalism is underwritten by the state, end of. And without the state, you wouldn't get it. Um, and unfortunately, we've, you know, uh, again, I'd, if, if those of you are old enough to remember Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, where they pretended the Earth was going to explode, be hit by a big um, meteorite, and the hairdressers marketing PR people, not communications, <laughs> um, advertising people were sent. I'd happily sent Bezos, Musk, and all the rest of them to Mars, which I understand takes 16 to 24 months to get to and back again. There is an issue, and there's a clear issue about who owns space. And so we've got colleagues in the astrobiology who've done a lot of work on space and law. And one of the great things, um, and I, sh I missed it on the slide, is the work that was done by the citizenship and yeah. governance uh, strategic research area on that very thing. And there is a danger of all these private satellites going up because when, I mean, it's good for Stoke because the ceramics built the go on Orion, but when they come back into Earth, there's a real danger. So it's something, again, we have to really look like. And it's like big tech. You know, the internet was going to free us all. But again, it's just another, if you like, development in monopoly capitalism. So again, in terms of space research and pro programs, be careful which, what you wish for. Um, but at least in other European countries, um, there is some, and particularly in Italy, there's some attempt to actually look at that role. Um, we will need a change of government here, as, as you well know. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you.